talking about uh, the background of John Anderson. I think, I think probably my first go at strength sports was was uh, picking up repeatedly picking up ice cream containers, <laughs> looking for the championship ring or belt <laughs> or or whatever it was in the bottom of that container. But there was no luck. Uh, so. Once I finally uh, decided to pull my tits back into my shirt and give this thing a go, I, I've trained all my life from football on. Um, and then Strawman was my first official uh, uh, organized competitive go. Um, that was in the early 2000s. Um, yeah, it was a, all of my life I've always been the guy that did my homework first, so to speak. Um, like in Strongman, my first contest until I made Team USA was only about 15 months, and I think four contests. Um, so I've always been the guy where, you know, probably because, you know, being a fat kid, terribly insecure, and never thinking I'm good enough, always drove me to work really hard and not want to put it on the line until I felt like I actually could do something and I think the way that my mind is the way that my and it's still the same way today you know my the way my mind works is I always think that I can't do as well as I'm gonna do which in turn makes me work that much harder so so strongman was great because uh you know all of the years that I've trained in the gym like a crazy man you know a lot of times you know I, I had no mentor I would put on 405 on the, on a squat and I'd say, how many times can I squat this before I have to put it away or until I fall down? You know, and those, this, we're talking like 19, oh man, 19, like early 90s, 91, 92, 93, nobody ever heard of this. They're like, what's this kid doing? You know, and then, you know, the big swing of dicks at the gym would try to squat 405 for 20 and hit the deck at 13. <laughs> and, you know, all of a sudden I, I started to gain some some in-gym credibility, you know, which uh, I think that was big in, in building my confidence because, <clears throat> you know, I mean, even still today, I can get up, wipe the sleet out of my eyes, and I look in the mirror, and I still see that fat little fucker with the tits hanging out in the other side right there, right there, you know. So a lot of times I'm going to the gym, and I'm eating right, I'm doing all my stuff to ensure that little fucker doesn't come back to this side of the mirror, you know. And as a Early on in my in my strength, all of what I'm talking about was probably I, I was I felt like I had something to prove. I don't know to who, but I mean I was working hard and I, I was I mean I just everything was about getting stronger. Um, so all of the crazy shit that I did in the gym, it just played into strongman so perfectly because <clears throat> I never really knew why I did what I did. I didn't know why I was doing these lifts that were very outside the box and unconventional. I wasn't doing set to five like everybody else. Um, but then when, you know, I did my first strongman competition, it just made sense. Won my first one, um, went to a national, won my pro card, went to uh, my first pro nationals, um, placed high enough to go on my first international trip. So you're talking, like I said, you're talking in a, you know, less than an 18 month period. You know, I went from virtually unknown, never competed in the strength, uh, in uh, a strength competition or strongman for that matter, to being a guy who was, you know, getting paid to travel the world, man. It was fucking awesome, you know? And then uh, <clears throat> from there, I mean, I had a killer, seven, almost eight year run strongman. Um, had some of the relationships that I built with friends are still they're still there. Um, I learned a ton, you know. I mean, you get you get out and you you get up against. You know, when I say that, I don't mean like competing. Of course, you're competing against them, but you know, bus rides and dinners. You know, you're sitting there talking to some of these guys that are from other countries that have a whole different bag of tricks and how they go about doing their training and their training style, their nutrition. So you learn so much. I mean, you can't <clears throat> you can't get that. You know, it, in a, a gym, you know, you, you can't just show up to a goals gym and, and get that. You, you got to get out in the world. You got to get exposed to this stuff. <clears throat> and so, anyway, my strongman career was killer. It was one, one of the best times of my life. Um, 
you know, I was definitely, even though, you know, I was over 300 pounds, you know, in my career, I was anywhere between, you know, slightly under 300 to 325, which obviously for most standards, it's huge. Today's standard is actually a midget, <laughs> you know. Proudest moment in Strongman? Proudest moment in Strongman. Oh, man. Probably winning my pro card was, was right at the top. Uh, actually, that day, I set a record that still stands. It was an amateur record because I wasn't pro yet. <clears throat> 500 reps, excuse me, 500 pound deadlift, 21 reps in 60 seconds. Nasty, painful 60 seconds, let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, you know, from then, from, from strongman, you know, being, uh, you know, you know the, being in there for a while, there's a shelf life for a smaller, shelf life for everybody, but especially for a smaller guy. Um, went from, you know, you, you know, just busting your ass, giving it up, and shit starts breaking. So, you know, I had to have back surgery. And, uh, you know, you, you, what do you do from there? You hang it up? <clears throat> That's not me, you know. I mean, the, it's like, uh, you know, the, the fat kid's constantly in pursuit of me, you know. I got to outrun that little son of a bitch. So. In, uh, in, in, in Strongman, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but in Strongman, uh, you were able to accumulate, or through Strongman, uh, you were able to accumulate um, a decent amount of sponsorship. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, talk about that a little absolutely. Bit. Well, this is, you know, it's a great, interesting topic because <clears throat> back in those days, social media wasn't even, it wasn't even started yet. So obviously that wasn't even part of the equation as far as social media, or excuse me, as far as sponsorship. Nowadays, they want your social media following. So, you know, you can be a, you know, three footed, you know, dipshit, but if you've got a million followers, you're gonna have people calling you for social, for sponsorship. Back in those days, in the early 2000s, you had to be the guy that, you had to have that magnetism that people wanted to see. You had to be able to talk to people, I mean, you could, you could theoretically now gain a sponsorship probably through email just by displaying on some sort of a spreadsheet what you've gotten following. Those days, you were meeting with somebody because they wanted to see, they wanted to know John Anderson, they wanted to know Mark Bell, they wanted to know if, if, if they were hanging their banner on the person, was that person going to represent their products the way they wanted. So anyway, so I, I was, you know, I had that in, in, as my personality. And uh, I looked very different because, uh, like I said, I'm always out trying to outrun the fat kid, you know, trying to keep my tits up nice and high. So I didn't look like every fat motherfucker in the sport. <clears throat> I was in good shape. And then, um, was that, I'm sorry, was that, uh, was that planned? Like you, you set out to be in better shape than everybody else in Strongman? I was kind of forced by the fat kid, you know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, it's just, it, to be honest, it's kind of like, it's, I just, I mean, the way that, the way that I am and, and the things that I went through as a kid, being picked on and all the bullshit and the insecurity that I developed, it, it does, I don't even know how it could be another way. You know, it's, it's just, you know, it's me. Were you, you know? bullied a lot as a kid? Yeah. You picked on a lot? Were you, yeah. were you the fat kid? I was. Were you so heavy I was, that you were the fat kid? What's that one? Were you so heavy that you were like like the fat kid, like the main focus of people? I think, think that I was. I wasn't the fat kid, but I was like a perfect. I was easy and I was great prey because I was fat and I was a pussy. <laughs> so you could make me cry real easy. <laughs> you know, if we're a bully, what else do you want? You know, yeah. you know, to make the fat kid cry real easy, you look like an even bigger stud than you know. So, so uh, is there a, um, an incident of uh, being? Uh, uh, so uh, vulnerable that you recall, like where someone made you cry or somebody did something oh. or said something. Oh yeah, Are you where you were me? just like, you know what? Fuck this, man. I'm not taking this anymore. I'm. I need to figure out a way out of this. You know that I would have that feeling just about every time that I got bullied. Like you know, everything from you know, like I remember uh, riding the bus to the school back. You know where like like where I live, there's no buses. My I take my daughters to school. But when I was a kid, I was on a 45 minute bus ride to school every day. So it was kind of a social thing. People were getting on there, listening to music, strutting their clothes. It was almost like the hallway, if you will. So, you know, so I'm fucking, you know, fucking people spitting in my face. And I mean, you know, so, so you climb on the bus, somebody spits in your face in the first five minutes, you got 40 more minutes of school. I just couldn't hold the tears back, you know, I and mean, I'm, you know, so basically I would get bullied. I was a mama's boy. 
So I'd get bullied, I'd fold like a chair, start fucking crying like a bitch, and then it just made it that much better for the next time for the people that wanted to pick on me. But, um, you know, I, I mean, looking back, I mean, all that stuff made me who I am. You know, and I, I don't hold grudges. I don't, I'm not one of those guys, oh, I'm going to go get this guy and get that guy. You know, I see a guy that bullied me, I treat him like any other person, you know. If, if anything, I should probably thank him because I got a hell of a lot better life than he's got. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm living the life I want. You know, I don't wake up and drive to work every day. You know, I wake up and, and live my dream. You, you know? mentioned um, seeing the fat guy in the mirror still, but do you remember a time uh, when those bullies kind of disappeared because you got some muscle on you? Yeah, <clears throat> I do, you know, and, and I remember actually there was a, you know, he, he, he was a friend by the time high school was over. His name was Brent Lamb. And, uh, you know, he was kind of a hard ass. And I remember one, his, his old thing, I mean, he was such like a to the point bully. He would literally come up and get in your face and say, you want to fight? I mean, that's how basic it was. It wasn't even like poking on you. He just wanted to like make you say, no, I don't want it. You know, please, you know, save me, you know? <laughs> and so I it was somewhere in the end of high school, he got up in my face and did it again. You know, you want to fight? And I remember thinking of myself as like, it's like the world slowed down. And I thought, you know, son of a bitch, this is my moment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back and I'm going to say whatever you want. Nice, calm, cool, and collective. He looked at me like, the fuck, this guy normally gets the hell out of here right now, you know? <laughs> so, so it was, you know, there was definitely some, some coming of age moments like that. But, you know, to be honest, I got to say, I, you know, it was traumatic in how it made, it affected me, like, when it comes to, to like, when I reference being traumatized by the fat kid, it's because, you know, you know, being this, it, it really, the, the picking on part was great, but I think if you really boil it down, what was the most disappointing to me was my own personal self failures and lack of discipline, everything that went into being that fat kid. It wasn't the fact that I, getting picked on surface shit, you know, I don't have to deal with that guy that's picking on me 24 seven. I got to deal with myself when I say, okay, you're going to have your dinner and you're not going to have dessert. I got to deal with myself going to bed at night when I have my fucking dinner and ate all the goddamn sweets in the house. That was the tough part because it was the own personal letdown and the personal failures. That's the hard part. I mean, the physical getting picked on and getting embarrassed, and she goes away, you know, and, and I, like I said, I hold no grudges for that stuff. If anything, the people that bullied me, including, you know, my, my next in line brother, <clears throat> you, know, I, I, you know, I thank him. He read my book, he read Deep Water, and he was like, are you ever gonna forgive me? I was like, dude, are you kidding me? And I'm a thank you. What are you talking about? I know I'm, I, I don't hold grudges. This is, you know, I wrote this as, you know, as this is like something I wanted to share. I, nobody held a gun to my head and say, expose yourself. You know, I pulled my pants down because I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, so it's, you know, the, it's, it's really much more. It's not the bullying thing is not a surface thing. It really gets down to who a person is, who I was my own lack of, of discipline. And I think that's one of the things I hold my hat on now is that I, I really, really hang my hat on being a disciplined motherfucker. You know, if I say I'm gonna do something, it's done. And sometimes it gets me in trouble because I say I'm gonna do something and I'm, you know, maybe a day or two later, I'm like, son of a bitch, I gotta do this now. And I do it and then sometimes it really sucks. But that is the, I mean, that is like, I mean, Without it, I'm nothing because that's what gets me out of bed at 3.30 in the morning to go get on that stair climb when I don't want to. That's what keeps me from not eating, you know, the rice that, that the restaurant puts on my plate. That's the thing that makes me do all the things that most people won't, you know. And it allows me to suffer. Like one of the things I've really been, you know, it's, I have these little mantras, you know, when I'm getting a tough spot. And... <clears throat> I am now very confident, just like I'm very confident that I work harder and have more discipline than everybody else. I'm willing to suffer more than the other people around me too. That's what allows me to get further down the path faster than those around me because I, I don't have, I mean, well, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, I love, I love the process of what I do. So training to me is fun. It's not a job, but you know, that, that's a whole other topic, you know, but when, when you're willing to do things harder and 
in longer. It sounds like we're talking about a porno right now. <laughs> I guess that, that's another one too, you know. Yeah, Mark, that section's later. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. So I think that all of what we're just talking about leading back to, you know, being picked on. And it really, I think, like I said, it really attaches itself to the own, my own personal letdowns and my own personal lack of discipline, my own personal failures. And that's where the root of all this comes from. So when I say the fat kid, the fat kid is a symbol of what I don't want to be. Not physically. It has more to do with, you know, with, with the discipline and all the stuff we just talked about. It's, it's so much, you know. It's, there's so many topics we talk about. One of the things, you know, you and I were just kind of skirting around. Everybody thinks that what we do here is physical, but it's, there's so much more beneath the skin. And people miss that. And that's, that's, I think that's what allows the people that get it, it allows them to get ahead so much faster than everybody else. How did you get involved in training in the first place? Um, I mean, I was always inspired by big people. It didn't make a difference. It was a big chick. Big dude, of course, Arnold Schwarzenegger. First time I saw him, I was blown away. But a big, a big, strong person, I was just, oh my God. I just knew I want to be that. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And so I had like these, you know, these huge, like, 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 almost like you, I could feel almost like I was going to throw up type inner movements about wanting to take this action to become this big, strong guy. I just didn't know where to start. You know, so I had a weight room in my bedroom and you know, I'd be up there doing you know, whatever I could, but it wasn't until <clears throat> I got to high school and when you played football, you had to lift weights. They saw that to be part of the safety, you know, to, you know, to keep the kids safe, I think it was a great idea. And that's when I was entered into a more of a formal, you know, some sort of a, it was a program. There, there was some, you know, there was a start and a finish, so to speak. It wasn't just me in my bedroom lifting shit, yelling, making sounds, you know. So <clears throat> that's when it started. And then, you know, uh, you know, like a lot of people that end in strength sports, you realize you're better at the, at the lifting weights than you were the sport you're training for. <laughs> and so, you know, you off you go. But uh, how'd you build the, uh, the confidence to even get started? You said that you had a burning desire to, you know, you were always into strength and you, <clears throat> you liked looking at those people. But how did you, uh, how did you kind of see those people and say like, like, even though I'm a fat kid, I got to try to figure out a way to do that. How'd you, how'd you get past that? How'd you, you get know, past yourself, basically? A little, little side note as you say that. I sit here and I adjust my, my band right here. I'm 290, 95 pounds, just finished with, with a bodybuilding show. I'm in great shape, and I'm sitting here feeling like I look fat. <laughs> <laughs> a little it's snapshot because, of it. It's because you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mike was thinking the same thing. Yeah. You know, how'd you, how'd you overcome oh, the insecurities okay. that you had uh, to even just get yourself started? You that? know, one of the things that I've been blessed with is, and I honestly don't have, um, you know, like a, a, a direct answer where it comes from, but it, it's always been there with me. I, I've been one of these people, and, and sometimes it gets put into the wrong perspective. It, 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 I'm very good at deciding what I want and just doing it. I'm not the guy, I'm not gonna sit there and talk about what I want, you know? <clears throat> Even when I was the fat kid, you know, I, I wanted to be big and strong, so I got that weights and I put it in my room and I bust my ass. It didn't stop me from having those failures of going downstairs and eating a fucking bucket of ice cream, but I didn't talk about wanting to be a big guy. I, I started taking action. I just, you know, like, you know, most people that get started, even adults, they just don't know where to start, you know? And so taking the action was never, <clears throat> that was never a huge issue like uh, you know a quick fast forward you know once I once I gained the the confidence and decided I wanted to compete strength sports when the straw man did that deal you know it's pretty uncommon for somebody to say hey you know I, I had a back surgery I'm gonna go wrestle in Japan you know and then yeah. we're done with that I'm gonna now become a pro bodybuilder I, I didn't go through a actually you know interestingly enough it was the San Jose Fit Expo two years ago um, I was doing the announcing for Ode Haugen's contest. You were there with the Slingshot booth. Yep. And that uh, was when you'd introduced me to, to Brandon that, that, uh, cause he'd just written, uh, the cube method and, and you were kind of, you were kind of, yeah, you were kind of, uh, you were like, Hey, you know, the deep war articles, there's something here. You know, think about doing a book <laughs> that, that was that weekend that I'd kind of decided that, Hey, you know, my wrestling career in Japan is starting to slow down. I'm going to, I think I'm going to give the bodybuilding run 
a start. That was and two who, years. And who got you moving in the right direction to go to Japan and wrestle? Look into the camera and say, Mark Bell That's right. John Anderson. You know what? I didn't realize that. that's right because when I was in Tran. Fifth pound. <laughs> when I was, because when I was in, that's right, when I was going from straw man to wrestling, that was, we actually, that's right, I came up here, I showed you a, a CD, we yeah. chatted a little bit, you kind of pointed him in a direction, that's right, I forgot about that, look at that, man. Jewish. You don't have, and you just said you don't have a mentor, you know how insulting that is? <laughs> <laughs> so on that level, what you're saying, I've never had a problem with just doing, right. you know, if, if I have a thought, you know, I mean, if it's a, if, of course, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not like I said, boy, I'd like to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, it's fucking silly. But, you know, if I have a thought of something that I think that, and, and keep in mind, I like these thoughts of things I'm going to try to achieve to be way out there. A goal that I can reach and touch right here doesn't excite me. I want a goal when, and I say that to people, I, my goals are big enough that most people don't understand them. They think I'm crazy. And if they're not that big, I'm not doing it right. Because if, I'm, if my goals aren't big enough to make some people think I'm crazy, then... I'm not going to have to really, really dig down deep and work hard to get there. And I, I try to reach my goals as quickly as I can, and some of them are pretty freaky goals. Being, uh, <laughs> being so focused, uh, how do you deal with um, when you haven't reached your goals? There must be a few that you left behind <laughs> somewhere, along, somewhere along the line. <clears throat> well, Terry, my other half, she says that <clears throat> when I set a goal and I go into one of these modes, that I just kind of, I, I, I kind of become there, but I'm not there because I become so immersed in what I'm doing. But at the same time, being immersed in, in what I'm doing is what makes me happy, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's like if, if, if I'm caught between goals, I become, I become pretty unhappy. And what happens is I worry about things. I, I'm a worrier, uh, for sure. I, I get that from my mom. She's, you know, she, you know, I could have done something really stupid, simple, wrong as a kid. She thought I was going to go to the goddamn juvenile hall, you know what <laughs> I mean? But that was just her train of thought. I'm that same way. And so <clears throat> I realized that if I'm going to put forth all this energy to worry about something, why don't I put it forth and worry about reaching a goal? Well, if I'm going to sit there and worry about something I can't control, what the hell good does that do? And, and, and I become very unhappy at the same time, you know, and as we all know, you know, if you're not happy yourself, you don't make the people around you happy. It's just a, it's a vicious cycle, you know. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, some of this stuff, honestly, I, I did not figure out about myself until the last few years. You know, as we get older, we get, you know, obviously smarter and understand ourselves better. Um, and, uh, you know, when I kind of had that, that moment of enlightenment, I thought, God damn, this, this makes such good sense. You know, I'm gonna, the, I felt like moving from here forth. I feel like I'm going to be so much more potent and more my, the potential of me reaching my goals is going to be so much greater because, you know, like to let's just say that, that you have a hundred worries per day. Let's just say break it down really stupid, simple. If I'm not like working on some freaky large goal that people don't understand, if I'm not spending my worries on that, I'm going to spend them somewhere else that I can't get. So why not spend them on something I can actually help, something I can go move forward with, you know, being productive. It's, uh, you know, for me, happiness is about forward movement. You know, that's where deep water came. I was one of my huge inspirations for writing deep water was that <clears throat> I figured that, you know, if coming from where I started off, you know, and, and I'm not trying to play the victim. I wasn't beat, you know, I had loving parents. I was just a fucking fat kid that had no self-discipline and, and wallowed in his own fucking stink because he couldn't fucking get up and, you know, stay focused and get to work, you know. So, you know, the, the, the bottom line, you know, if where I started from, if I can do what I did because of, you know, channeling my energy, you know, I know that there are other people out there that have my challenges. I want them to understand that they can do, that they can, they can be who they want to be, they can reach their goals. It's just, it's a matter of, of, of taking your potential and putting it, you know, into a channel that it's, it's like a laser, so to speak. You know, you can have a, you know, like if you took all the light coming out of one of these fluorescent bulbs, it's going everywhere, it's supposed to light the room. Now, if there was a way that you could snap your fingers and turn it into one beam, it would be a whole different creature. And that's what, it's almost like what deep water is, is taking your, taking your potential and, 
focus and putting it into that thing that allows you to do what other people don't and what they can't, you know? And, um, you know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm just a, <laughs> I'm a fucking average guy with average genetics that decided it was time to, to work his ass off and reach some goals. And then I kind of came in love with, with, uh, you know, the whole thought of uh, you know, the thought and the feeling and the actual, you know, the forward progress. And, and, uh, it's, it's a, you know, we've, we've all done something where we look back and we're like, God, that was a waste of time. And it is, there's nothing there. You know, it's like, you know, there, especially when you start to realize how life, how, sh how short life is, you know, you want to spend your time on things that you want to spend it on, you know, life. What happens is <clears throat> and I tell my daughter this all the time. People get life chooses them. They don't choose their life. And then next thing you know, they wake up, they're fucking 45. They're stuck in traffic, driving to a job they don't want to go to. And life's got a hold of them. They got no choices. Choices are over. You know what I mean? Choose your life. Don't let life choose you. You know, that's part of deep water too. It's, you know, do your, you know, it, it's not about just sitting by the wayside and, and letting, you know, letting your days and your life, you know, be dictated to you. You dictate that shit. Go get that shit, you know? So, um, going, going back to what you said, you know, taking action has never been, um, is, is never been a, a tough one for me. However, I will say that once I started to understand how to use my power, which, I mean, first off, Deep Water is me. That book is me. That is how, I, it's my manual. That's, that's how I did what I did, you know. I, I'm, like I said, I'm not some genetically gifted freak. I just was, you know, I worked my ass off, found the way to do it, made the, got the forward momentum and, and was able to pull some shit off and achieve some stuff. And that's, that's what it's all about. And that's, you know, you're, you're, you work to have what you want, not so that you work to have what you don't want, you know? Let's discuss this a little bit further, not, not to beat a dead horse here, but I do think it's important to know, know people's origin, sure. know, know where they came from. And, uh, you know, you're mentioning that basically you know, all kind of through your, your teen years, you were fat. Um, two things, one is, you know, at the age of 15 or 16, uh, did you ever kind of think you'd be able to pull yourself out of that? Um, and then the second question to that would be, uh, you know, what if somebody came to you at that age and said, hey, I want you to do, a, like, I think you'd be great for this, I want you to do a bodybuilding show. You know, what would, what would the thought process be? It'd probably scare the shit out of you, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. So if, if someone had come to me and asked me, say, hey, you know, I see something, let's do a bodybuilding or powerlifting, whatever, you know, <clears throat> I would have jumped at the chance, you know, because I always felt like I was trying to do something like that. I just didn't, I didn't know where to start. I didn't have the angle. So if I, you know, it, and like I said, one of the things I'm kind of proud of is that I've come all this distance without having a mentor in my early days. So had I had one early on, I think it might've really changed stuff around. I, I don't know where, I mean, I would assume that I could have gotten further, but maybe not, who knows. But the bottom line, at that point in time, if someone had come along and, and given me an opportunity, I would have definitely taken it. I, would, I don't know how successful I would have been. I, maybe I would have still lost myself in the bottom of the ice cream containers, <laughs> you know, when I wasn't supposed to. But <clears throat> that would have been, because it, you know, the, I mean, we've all been in that situation where you feel like you want to do something great, you know what I mean? But you just don't know where to start. That's a tough place to be. But if you've got someone that will kind of lay out a path for you, it, it, it kind of helps clarify, takes some of the pressure off. Yeah, so I definitely would have taken the opportunity. I don't know how it would have gone. And I think that if you, I think looking back, I really believe that things happen for a reason. So I think that didn't happen for a reason for, I, I don't know why, but I think that it, it shouldn't have happened, but well, I didn't. Um, <clears throat> the other so, question being, uh, you know, uh, when you were, uh, like how long did it take you to start to get in better shape and start to, start to just um, like overall just feel better about yourself? Well, <clears throat> that's a good, how to, it took me a long time to feel better about myself when I was in that kind of that early fat stage. And what happened, it was almost like, <clears throat> you hear about like drug addicts and people with major problems hitting rock bottom. Well, I kind of went through that phase with me being a fat motherfucker. Because I, I can remember, as a kid, I would get on my bike, you know, and this is back when you, a quarter, remember the days you get a quarter, you get a big old 
candy bar. So I'd save up two, three bucks. I'd ride 10 miles to the, to the local store so I could sit outside on the bench and eat candy. You know, and of course, then when it's all over, I got that long ride home, and a lot of times I'd end up crying because, you know, I couldn't believe I did it again. <laughs> and that's the process I'm referencing right there. So, much like that guy, you know, who everybody has to watch hit rock bottom with some sort of a problem, I was that guy that had to hit rock bottom with my own patheticness, <clears throat> you know. And here again, going back to, I don't want to just say it was an eating problem, it had more to do with a discipline problem. It had to do with, me just not being able to do what I was supposed to do, you know. Um, so that that whole thing, what happened was you can only cry so many times. You know, it's like, you know, with the bullying thing, it never happened to me, but I've seen it happen where, you know, you somebody hits you one too many times and you fucking freak out. <laughs> and you go and you beat his ass, you know. Because <laughs> right. you don't care because you've been pushed so far you it doesn't make a difference if he breaks your neck. You're going to hit him just one time. You know what I mean? And that's where I was with letting myself down. You know, I had cried one too many times. You know, I had fucking told my, you know, uh, you know, told my parents that I was going here so I could go fucking get some ice cream. Or I wouldn't go with them when they were going somewhere so I could sit in the house and eat all the fucking sweets in the house. I mean, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's that sickness where it seems like such a great idea until it's all gone and then you got to sit there and look yourself in the fucking face and realize god damn it i did it again and here comes all the bullshit and all the tears and whatever you got to do to to come with the fact that you let yourself down again and finally you do it one too many times and you just don't care anymore and that's where it starts through those uh teenage years you know a lot of guys are, are starting to try to chase girls and they're trying to get a girlfriend right uh, I spent was... a lot of time jerking off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your right hand became your girlfriend. I actually could do it with both. That's how much oh, I did it. You know, I get a cramp on the right one. Well, here we go. Yeah. Start, <laughs> start became ambidextrous. Oh, I thought you meant you were gifted. No, <laughs> no, no. no I, I'm not sitting here trying to tell you I got a monster cock on film. No, that's not it. I'm just saying when I got a cramp on my right side, the left one was ready. <laughs> <laughs> so there was not a lot of chasing girls. Not that, did I try? Yes, but you know, I, I, mean, I got fucking shut down. You get right. shut down enough times, you just stop doing it. Right. You know. And then uh, it was about. Uh, it was later in high school. I was still. I it, the transformation had started. You know, um, <clears throat> and I think the biggest thing in that transformation was not the way I looked, but it was my demeanor. It was how I acted. Who I was becoming. You know, because mentally, I, I like I said, I kind of hit that point where it was just, I wasn't, gonna, there was no more tears left. Plenty of ice cream, but I didn't have the tears to support it when I was done. <laughs> the aftermath, so, um, you know, then it's just, it was, uh, it just started to change. And then I remember uh, I ended up, I ended up, my first real girlfriend was a, was a chick down the street that I had had a crush on forever. So it was like, oh man, I'm not gonna tell you. It, I mean, it, I mean, it was like a dream, you know. I mean, holy shit, it was crazy, you know. And uh, it's like I said, it was. It, and it, at that point, now the momentum starting. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know the. Um, I wasn't looking for happiness in you know in the bottom of the ice cream container anymore. I wasn't looking for happiness in the candy section at the grocery store anymore. I had other things that I had that were bringing me happiness and. You know, as I sit here and explain this, looking back, you know, that probably was the biggest hiccup with me being in that phase so long was I hadn't really gravitated to something that brought me happiness to get me out of that, that kind of that, that uh, negative spin that I was in with letting myself down all the time, you know. How did you start to learn about, uh, like, you said you played football, you learned a little bit about training. How did you start to learn about, like, getting yourself in better shape? Because it doesn't just happen from oh. lifting. Dude, that was a, let me tell you, that is a puzzle. So, you know, of course, you're just, you're taking information from anywhere you can find it, you know? So think like television, obviously the mass media. And think back when we were kids, first it was got to drink milk, you know? Then it was got to eat bread, you know? So this whole time frame you just asked about, about how I found, uh, you know, what was it that allowed me to kind of start, you know, gathering information. I was gathering the wrong information, but I was trying. 
So I'm seeing these, you know, these commercials, you know, eat wheat, you know, wheat's this, wheat that. So I'm going to the grocery store and I'm not in the candy section anymore. I'm in the bread section. And I'm buying six, eight loaves of bread at a time. And my friends are looking like I'm fucking nuts because I'm sitting there eating pieces of wheat bread <laughs> with nothing on them, thinking that that's going to build muscle, you know? I mean, <clears throat> literally, that's, that's, how, that's how it was. I mean, if, if, if I was convinced that eating dog shit was going to make me gain muscle, I would have grabbed the turd, gone where nobody could see me, and started chewing on that fucker. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's, that's, that was it. I mean, it was, a, it, it was not a thing in my mind where it's like, you know, do I want this? It was, it was, it was there, you know? So um, gathering that information to, to become in better shape was tough. And to be honest, I didn't have my first, like, um, I, guess, I, I guess you'd say that I didn't stumble across my first piece of real feedback with protein until I was 19 and um, it was really really clear my one my best friend was also my training partner uh, cancer survivor uh, his name is Josh Fink you know still one of the best dudes I know um, we used to train we were competitive we trained hard and he was on this big real nuts and berries and you know wheat bread and you know and somehow <clears throat> I had just decided that I was gonna start eating eggs and fish and shit like that. I don't honestly remember what had prompted me to do it, but something came along and made me think, hey, you know, this might be a better way. Well, that summer, I actually, you know, we were pretty even. By the end of that summer, I was substantially stronger than he was. So, always you can argue genetics and all this bullshit, dot, dot, dot. it's very true, but looking back, hands down, that was it. Because, you know, those days, we just, we didn't understand the importance of protein. You might have you know, an egg or two with, you know, a whole bunch of toast and cereal. You know, now you have, you know, you now have, you know, a dozen eggs and, you know, I don't even eat carbohydrate for Christ's sake, you know. So <clears throat> once, uh, once I recognized that, that protein had that punch, it was lights out, you know. Then uh, shortly thereafter, I had started, because I'm in college by this point, so I'd started going to Costco. And in those days they had, now they have 10 pound sacks. In those days, in the, in the early 90s, they had four pound sacks. So I'd do is I'd buy, every week, I'd buy seven four pound sacks of chicken breast. And every day I ate four pounds of chicken. And that's when my strength and my size just exploded. You know? I've heard uh, in your strongman days, you used to eat like a pound of bacon every day, some of that? That was from, uh, I mean, that was, I did eat a lot of bacon, obviously, because there's, there's not a ton of protein, there's a ton of fat, so it was calories I was after. I did that mostly after injuries because, you know, injuries, what would happen is, <clears throat> especially in strongman training and my style of training, pushing yourself so hard, you're burning these calories and your appetite is humongous, right? So then all of a sudden, you know, you get hurt, your training changes, your appetite goes way down. Well, you still got to get calories in to, to keep your weight up. Um, and so that's where the bacon came. I mean, you could put a couple thousand calories in bacon, not a lot of space in your stomach. So, <laughs> so that was a big... Bacon was a staple, but it was a calorie issue for sure. It was, uh, you know, trying to look at, okay, I've got X amount of space. I need to get X amount of calories in there. How do I do it? You know? I think nowadays you uh, mentioned to me in an article for Power Magazine that you, uh, I can't, I'm not sure if I can remember correctly, but you eat about a cow per year or something <laughs> like that, right? I so, mean, if you do the math on that, dude, it's crazy. crazy that I five eat, pounds of meat a day or something uh, like Five that? pounds is, is a for sure. There are times where I may eat seven, you know? I mean, even on right here, you know, when I was coming into super training, just between the freeway and, and pulling in, I had a pound of chicken driving, you know? Yeah. I mean, every time I eat, I'm going to eat a pound, you know? And I'm going to eat minimum five times a day. Minimum. I mean, I'm five times, if I only eat five times, it's because I woke up late and fell asleep early. Normally, I was six, maybe seven times. So let's just take the happy medium. Let's call it six, right? So what, six times 365? What is that? Yeah, right. A lot. That's a shitload of, <laughs> of, of, of meat, man. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's just, that's what worked for me, you know? Um, everybody has what they believe works for them. And I have never wavered in what I believe works for me, you know? And, and coming from the kid who was scared of his own shadow, you know, and, and could only dream of being, you know, a big, strong guy. Going, coming from there to where I am now and what I've done with my three different careers, I mean, 
I'm not. I'm. I'm it's. It's a lock to me. I mean, how do you argue that? When you did know? your uh, goals kind of transition from running away from being the fat kid to turning it into a sport or turning it into a lifestyle or a career even? So when, that's a good question. When did my goals go from, from just becoming not a fat kid into actually you know, making a, a lifestyle and a living with what, what I do? You know, I think like every kid, you have a dream of being a pro football player or whatever it is. And there's a point in time where, you know, even when I was sitting there eating a, you know, a gallon of Dryer's ice cream, I believed I could do it. <laughs> you know, but then you get into, you, you finally make the varsity team and you realize that there are people that are just so much better than you. It's, it, you, you become a realist and you just, you know, okay, let's, let's, I mean, when I talk about freaky goals, I, I'm not talking about things that are impossible. I'm talking about things that, that might have the illusion of being impossible, but, <laughs> that, but are possible, you know, and being a pro football player was not possible. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but along those lines, I always had the dream of, of being a pro athlete. And I think most kids do. I mean, God, it's, it's, it's kind of how we're, you know, the way that our society is, you know, I mean, our, our athletes are glorified and, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I, I think this is the way it should be. I mean, to, to be a pro athlete on whatever level you're talking about, you have to have a much higher commitment than the average person. And there's some glory in that. So to answer your question, it really kind of came to where, I mean, as a, as a kid, when I started actually getting in shape, my dream was to be a pro bodybuilder. So this last two years is, is kind of been like pretty surreal, almost like being a kid again, which has been, you know, really could you know, being in my forties, Feeling like I'm 15 again is pretty awesome. I got to tell you, <laughs> you know, I, I used to look at magazines like with you know Don Long and some of these guys that were competitive. You know, I was 15, he's 25, right? You know, then I'm meeting these guys and interviewing me, and I'm like, God, this is freaking killer. You know, it was the coolest thing. So, my dream is being a pro bodybuilder. As a kid, I mean, I always dreamed that, and I was working towards that. And and there's nothing that says that you can't do that. It's not like you know. You know, you don't have a chance to get on a, a, a bodybuilding stage like you do a football field to rule that out. Does that make sense? So that dream was alive. And, uh, you know, then there, it, it, kind of, it kind of went south on me when bodybuilding took some, some, some negative, uh, you know, public press that, that really shines some pretty nasty light on it. And I kind of lost the, I just, I don't know, just kind of lost the glory and just the competitive part. I love the training. I love everything about it. I just didn't like what I, what I had. There was, you know, a couple of stories in the news about, you know, pro bodybuilders doing some pretty, you know, risque stuff, you know, to support their, you know, their lifestyles. So they didn't have to have jobs. And I, I mean, I, as a kid, I mean, it's still even now, I, I, I don't get that. You know what I mean? I think that there's a huge morality that, that a person has to have in order to be a healthy person to, you know, to be a role model, you know? I mean, you can't be a role model when you're doing certain things my opinion <laughs> anyway so um so you know that that dream was alive and i i just i just trained like a, an animal even everybody told me from the time i was a kid it's a marathon not a sprint i still believe that but on that level i 100 percent would try to convince anybody who wants to make progress yes it is a marathon but when you show up today to train it's a sprint you have to do both you can't you show up and train today like it's a marathon you won't make it anywhere you have to sprint today, and then when you're done, you know, go back to your thought, your, your marathon thought process, because the cooking and all that shit is marathon thought process, but you're not running a marathon when you're sitting under, you know, 600 pounds in a squat. <laughs> There's nothing marathon about that. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> anyway. Um, How'd you stumble upon uh, Strongman? So, that's kind of, it's, it's perfect. I was just getting there from, uh, from Mike's question. So, as I was killing in the gym i recognized quickly that i was actually stronger than i looked which that's where strongman came in because this the my buddy josh fink my best friend he always told me he said dude he's all listen you know as we were competitive so he had a lot of compliments but he would say look god damn it he said you know you're a big guy but you are so much stronger than you look you got to do something with this you know and um anyway so he finally convinced me he said just would you just fucking do it? Now he goaded me somehow, and finally he caught the nerve just right. <laughs> All right, here we go. So uh, 
that's kind of an interesting deal there too because you know here I'm okay I'm gonna compete in strongman and yes I'm I'm strong as a house you know I'm 200 and what 75 pounds in those days was a monster you know and uh, but I got I mean I see all this stuff on television but I got no idea how to do it nobody around where I live does it not even the equipment so a buddy of mine had this piece of property uh, in one town away he said look he said you know you can use this field you want to put some of this equipment out there go for it so I started accumulating equipment I got a tire I got you know you know some stones and it was a it was literally it was a, a dirt field I had to take one of those old school what do you call this a sling blade and cut the grass down it was like up to my waist and I put the equipment out there and I used to go out there in the heat and the and the mess and flip this tire and lift this stone and do all this shit that's how bad I wanted it and uh, I did my first contest and with you know, no guidance and very little exposure to the equipment I won it and I realized okay there's there's something here and uh, you know that's when that's when uh, the fire got lit for for more competitions I think honestly up to that point I'm kind of as I, as I sit here and explain this I think up to that point I think you know that old perspective the fat kid had a tighter grip on me than I thought. I, I don't think that I would have done it had I not had Josh not kind of, you know, dangled that carrot or goaded me. He, he, I think he saw that I needed to get kind of scared out of my gym comfort zone, you know? And that's when it all exploded because now all of a sudden I'm not just, you know, the strongest guy in the, in the gym. Now you want to be the strongest guy in the competition. These people are coming from everywhere. Even at an amateur level, they're coming from all over. Then you get into the pros, and then you go into uh, international pro. Now you're talking world competition. I mean, you guys get that. I mean, you get people coming from all parts of the world. I mean, there's just strong motherfuckers out there. You know, you can't overlook anybody when it's world competition. Were you able to uh, <laughs> turn your? Uh, were you able to turn being a pro strongman into? Uh, enough finances to make a living yeah we, we kind of tipped on that's right so this is back when we're talking about sponsorships so this is back before social media and they were actually buying the person and so i was a perfect candidate for all because i look different i'm personable the things they wanted it was there so anyway so long and short on top of this it was a perfect sweet spot time frame wise because this was during i guess it's called what they call the, the dot-com bombs or the the dot-com boom excuse me there was money everywhere, you know? And so there were these startup companies that were looking to give money away. You know, you know I mean, give it away. You know, they're looking to write offs and everything else. So, yeah, so, I mean, all in this really short period of time, you know? Like, I had one sponsor. It was, it was a three-year deal. Sweetest deal I ever had. So it was the easiest money I ever made. She had a three-year deal. I so much as, I mean, I was supposed to do all this stuff for him, but for 3000 a month in those days, I was like, I'll do it. It was, you know, it was, I had to do a couple of expos and do this, that, and the other. It was an energy drink called Havoc, um, based out of Dallas. Anyway, I got three t-shirts in the mail. They wanted me to wear the t-shirts, of course. And, uh, you know, the company was just kind of one of these, never quite got all the way off the ground. So I ended up, you know, getting, you know, 36000 a year for three years. Never fucking did anything but wear a T-shirt, you know. I mean, granted, they, they were all for it. You know, I mean, I was, wore those T-shirts wherever I was going. Um, and so that, that being the extreme example of how those days sponsorship was so much easier. Now to get 3000 a month out of a company, oh, my God. You're talking about, you better have a... I mean, a social media following that's just humongous. You better have some TV time, I and mean, we're talking big stuff. I've never been offered that. You yeah, know, I have one of the bigger followings. Of yeah, that, you know, I mean, it's crazy it's because, media, you know? yeah, I mean, if you know, it's 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 just such a different, you know, it, the landscape. It, it's 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 like night and day. It's like two separate worlds. How it was ten years ago. Social media has completely changed the sponsorship. What were uh, some of the other sponsors? Yeah, obviously MHP. Um, they've always taken great care of me. Um, uh, let's see here. You had meat, right? Yeah, I had grassland beef. That was probably that was just no, that, a, was that was before grass-fed beef was popular. Yes, like, uh, yes. Actually, you're you're kind of the first person I, I heard it from. Yeah, uh, through uh, Jesse Burdick. Yeah, yeah. And so um, this one was my favorite one because I mean, it, it, it was not a, a money deal, but I mean, with much beef as they gave me, it was money because they sent me. 
uh, over 100 pounds every month of you do the math on that when you're talking like <laughs> I mean especially like some of the, like a, like a fillet grass-fed product I mean Christ I don't even know what you pay for that now but it's gotta be what 15 20 bucks a pound some yeah. crazy yeah. shit I mean you could pay eight bucks for a pound of ground beef now of grass-fed you know so that was a sweet one I had that for a long time um, they're not an official sponsor anymore, but I still have a great relationship with them. They send me some stuff here and there, but I, I have another one now. Uh, it's called Bubba's Burgers. It's not an organic product, but you know, when you're eating five, six pounds a day, if someone wants to give it to you, you're gonna take it. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so like, you know, now, like I said, it's very different, you know, as far as the sponsorship goes. Um, but usually when you're when you're dealing with just getting product now granted there's a difference between getting you know fifteen hundred dollars a month in product versus getting fifty dollars a month in product you know you got to have something you know you're 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 not just going to give you you know a thousand plus a month in product just because you know you this falls into the social media and all the stuff you know i think that one thing that's really helped me sponsorship wise is the fact that i've been in the game for almost 15 years and I've had good sponsors which makes me you know more you know it, it makes you more reputable when you've had good deals in the past versus if you've never had a sponsor who wants to get first in line something's wrong with this guy <laughs> how did you end up accumulating a lot of sponsors <clears throat> um, so it started off with with um, you know like I said the the I think well there's a couple things the way I looked was a big part of it um, and then this is back before social media so in these expos I would meet people and they're like this guy we want to hang something on him you know and so it really came down to who I was you know right. I mean it, to be quite honest I social media has actually hurt my sponsorships over the course of the last 10 years because um, you know there was 10 years ago I could you know just to you know majority of the time I could see a product I like go shake the owner's hand and walk away with a sponsorship to some nature now you go up and you you ask you know you know you, first off you go up and ask for a sponsorship you look like a dickweed <laughs> <laughs> and then secondly if they even entertain you they're going to say well what does your following look like you know and then it's really then we get away from who you are we get into how good you are with your social media you know so <clears throat> but um, yeah so the the sponsorship thing didn't you have an agent at one point uh, yeah yeah I had did, uh, did back that, in, did that help. Absolutely. <clears throat> so that was that was helpful when it came to like movie bits and TV commercials and shit like that. Like uh, one of the sweetest deals, um, you know, I had was I was actually and back in those days, you did a lot of demos. You know, I'd get you know you might make anywhere depending on how good you were and how good. Like my agent hooked up a lot of these things because it was entertainment. You know, I would do like truck pull demonstrations, which are a piece of cake. You know, as long as as long as the truck was not an old piece of shit and it wasn't going uphill, all I'd do was get it moving. I wasn't racing anybody. I was just make it look hard. The crowd loved it. You know, um, I'd get anywhere from you know twenty five to four thousand bucks for a pull. It was a killer. You know, so I was up in Montana doing a truck pull, and he calls me and said, "Hey, you got a actually it was it was him and I think Dion Wessels actually had a hand in this too." Hey, we got a, a commercial for you to do <clears throat> down in Los Angeles. I'm 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 in I'm in uh, Montana right now. My poll's in about two hours. I'll be I can get out of here late tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay, so uh, they tell me a little bit about it. You know, this is back before email and phones and all that stuff. So it was the norm today. But I'll send you an email. <laughs> now, like you know, okay, well, I'll call you back tomorrow morning and tell you the details of what's going on. Well, it turns out they fly into Los Angeles, and it was a Super Bowl commercial that we were filming. And this was back; it was in <clears throat> there was it was called Sports Heaven, and they brought in. <clears throat> I mean, they were probably was a hundred athletes. It was crazy. Um, I was pulling a truck. There was an X Games guy, Antonio Gates. It was just there was tons of all at that era. You you mean you? There was a ton of you know top notch athletes there. And the, the, obviously being a Super Bowl commercial was as sweet as it gets. But the best part about it was every time that son of a bitch ran, it was sending me another check. <laughs> so, you know, so you get, you know, you get, <clears throat> you know, you got my MHP money, I got my Havoc money, I got commercial deals, I got 
exhibition deals. And there was also a time frame in my Stroman career where there was 20 of us in the world who got a monthly check from IFSA. We were actually on a payroll. So I was in a pretty cush life for, I mean, literally my job was to get up, prep my food, train, you know, and take care of whatever my schedule had to honor my, my sponsors. So, I mean, it was a, <clears throat> it was a sweet deal. And then when, uh, it is a great deal, but it is, it's something you also worked oh, probably yeah. like a decade, you, know, oh, you yeah. worked your ass off for a decade for it. So it oh, sounds yeah. cool and sounds cushy, but there's a lot of effort and a lot of yeah, it's, stress. It's, it's like pain. you hit it on the head. You figure, okay, yes, this was a sweet period in my life, but how many years of tireless hard work did it take to create that? Right. Lots, you know, but that's what makes it so satisfying, you know? I mean, it, when you work for something, it always feels better than what's given to you. Uh, tell us about some of the crazy shit you've done in the gym. Like, uh, you know, deep water doesn't just encompass uh, uh, the training, it's nutrition, it's kind of a lifestyle thing. Yep. So tell us uh, some of the deep water stuff that you've done in the gym before. Well, <clears throat> I mean, you hit it on the head first off, is deep water is, it's a lifestyle, deep water is me. Okay, the sleeves are in, let's make them live. Oh boy.